Greetings, Audio Avengers. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that means we're continuing our discussion of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, episode number four. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from multiple angles you will only find on this podcast. Our story cast is live, and Amanda and Maeve dig into themes of temptation, corruption, and the perils of inequality that are threaded throughout the episode. We also get into a debate about Zemo's role in the story that I have a question for Christine about, so definitely give that a listen if you can. On Wednesday's Ponder Vision, Jesse Taylor and I are going to dive into the most entertaining and creative questions we have for each other as we look ahead to episode five. We'll get into everything from a detailed discussion of candy in the MCU to whether the Avengers are in fact supremacists. And this is our character cast, where we explore episodes of Marvel TV through the lenses of the characters themselves. The time for getting to know people is basically over, and that means it is time to grade winners and losers and judge actions and outcomes as plans come into focus. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and to help me understand these characters better is the winner of every character cast, Christine Kippens. Hi, Christine. Hi, hi. So we got a Bucky arm reload and multiple knife tricks. I feel like it was a great aesthetic Bucky episode. Oh my God, no kidding. I mean, first of all, we start off with Bucky tears and I just, oh, I melted. I melted. Yeah. You know how much I love Bucky. And so to see him this vulnerable at the beginning and then see him fucking kicking ass and taking names at the end and doing that sexy ass knife flick that he's like known for. It was such a great episode for us Bucky stands. I loved it. I doubt he'll necessarily be one of our winners of the week, but what, let's get into some of that. So what we're going to do for this episode is go back to some of the stuff we'd done as WandaVision was kind of wrapping up, right? We're going to get into the winners and, and losers of the episode, and then we'll start talking about some of those decisions that people made and some of the roles that the characters played in the story. But we should start with who was the biggest winner of the week? The biggest winner of the week for me has to be Zemo. Yeah. Right? Has to be. I mean, so... When comparing him to Walker, Sam called him useful. There's (laughs) no more serum. So his plan is going great. Unfortunately, there is one more super soldier in the world, but he's about to be persona non grata. And Zemo managed to escape while still being able to utilize his wealth and resources. So, yes, he had to take a vibranium shield to the head to eventually get that freedom. But after years of imprisonment, I'm sure he'll take it. So all in all, I think Zemo had a great week. I tried to find somebody else, but I agree. And here's where Zemo won the week for me. He once again got heroes to fight each other. He had the Dora Mm. Milaje and Sam and Bucky fighting each other over Zemo and John Walker, two people they don't really even like or care about. So once again, his masterclass in turning people against each other comes to fruition. And it's so damn frustrating as he escapes scot-free. We also got to see that he has another great house, awesome house. He has an excellent cookie and tea game. Uh, you know, that, that tea set was just top delightful. I don't know why Bucky had to go and smash some of it. And that little cookie he had on his finger. I mean, I wanted that cookie. That all looked good. But he also made a killer point about the serum and supremacy, something that I think challenged both the characters and the audience. So yeah, Zemo, big win. Big win. I mean, and everybody's talking like him now. Yeah. He started to seep into the conscious of everyone around him. You know, Sam's been kind of using his talking points. I mean, he challenges Zemo at one point during the episode, which I think is good. But he took that message to Carly and challenged her on it. Like he's in everyone's brain right now. Yeah. Well, if we don't have another big winner, let's talk about some underrated or underappreciated winners of the week. Was there anyone who won more than maybe most folks might realize? Okay, so I really struggled with answering this question, Mark. I'm not going to lie. I eventually landed on Sarah. Okay. Because, you know, she helped confirm for Carly that Sam isn't public enemy number one. It's Walker. Um, And I think her mere existence helped because Sam even mentioning her to Carly, while dumb as fuck, right? Mm. Like, you don't share the fact that you have family with potential supervillains. But it helped humanize him a bit for Carly. 
you know, he's got a family just like she does. And chosen family is family. So don't nobody come in my mention saying different. And that conversation with Carly at Mama Donia's funeral helped Sam understand his sister's perspective a little bit more, which, you know, if she knew, I'm sure she'd be happy about. I hadn't really reflected on the fact that Sarah getting Sam to move through this conversation with Carly would be a huge win for her. We have talked multiple times about Sam's naivete and the fact that he's kind of pushing this perspective on Sarah. And if that has changed, that's exactly what this question is designed to get at, like some benefit for a character that most people might not have realized. So Mm -hmm. I will give you my underrated winner of the week, and that is Sharon. If she's the power broker, if she is the power broker, she has the heroes hunting Carly and the serum for her. She's got this cool satellite tech and clearly a bunch of Madripoor badasses working directly for her. You know, she had that walk through those guys with the machine guns and the barriers and stuff. Even if she's not the power broker, the fact that they didn't even flinch when she walked by, they didn't ask her a single question. Whoever she actually is, is so badass that everybody there respects and maybe even is scared of her. And she's got all this tech. If she can track John Walker, whether she's hijacking government information, I had this whole thing that maybe there was like a tracker in the soldier serum uh, because it's after he took it that she could track him. But truthfully, I think she has an exchange with Sam online on on Sam's computer screen and stuff. So I I think that's the classic Mark overthinking it theory. I'm going to walk away from that. But I do think, once again, Sharon demonstrated that she has a tremendous amount of power and influence in this world And people are consistently underestimating her. I agree 100%. I was actually going to ask you about Sharon at the end of the episode today. But shit, can we talk about her now? Because like that, that like 10 second walk through that underground graffitied area in Madripoor was everything. I mean, she didn't, as far as we could see, She wasn't carrying a weapon. Nope. And she wasn't hooded. She kept her head up, met people, looked at people in the eye, even gave like a little head nod to one of them like, yo, sup. And it seems like they're guarding her, right? It sure does. I I think the power broker theory gets another little boost. Huge. Because I'm like, I'm ready to be like, listen. I will still reserve the right to say I told you so if the power broker ends up being Zemo, but I am fully on the Sharon is the power broker train right now, especially the second she said I might have access to a satellite or two. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, like it's access to my mom's car or something, you know, I mean, that's how she tossed that off. I mean, I might, you know. Right. Like, like Zemo's like, yeah, I've got a house in Riga. We could go stay there. It's fine. Um, But like Sharon's got fucking satellites and stuff space that can track you down to where you are at street level and what does she say to sam she's like find carly at the end and it's like right. i mean that's what the power broker wants that's exactly right. the agenda of the power broker and we got reminded of that through the texts back to carly from the broker it just feels like sharon's agenda and the power broker's agenda seem real similar to me They line up, they line up. And again, the power broker is always watching. And what the fuck does a satellite do? Oh, shit. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, see, yeah, it's it's, she's she is a big winner of the week. But let's let's talk about some losers of the week. Who was the big loser of the week of this episode for you, Christine? I mean, R.I.P. Lamar and Nico Um, and probably Lamar more than Nico being the biggest loser. Right. Because like. Nico was decapitated by the man who carries the title of someone he was a fan of as a child, which is pretty fucking bad, right? (laughs) But he already knew to be distrustful of the new Captain America. So it wasn't like his hero murdered him in the middle of a square. Lamar, on the other hand, woof. (laughs) First of all, he definitely noticed a change in his bestie Walker over the course of the episode. You know, like when Walker was threatening Sam, Hoskins looked at him like he was growing another head out of his neck. Yes, he did. So I'm sure he was stressed about his buddy. And then he knowingly gets into a fight with gods on earth and dies. And one would think that the bad shit ends with the death. But no, his death flips another switch in Walker, which quite frankly was halfway flipped already. 
And Walker Tinton's an absolute monster. Can you imagine your death being the trigger for your best friend becoming a murderous supervillain? Your death makes your hero BFF into an international villain. That's a really bad fucking day. That's a really bad fucking day. It's hard to argue with Lamar. I also thought a lot about Nico for some of the reasons that you talked about. The shield didn't do great. I mean, it's covered in blood at the end. The myth of American exceptionalism didn't have a good day. And I don't think anyone's going to shed a, a tear for that. Cry me a river. Yeah, exactly. Um, but like any good drama, there are a lot of people taking losses in this episode. I landed on Carly. Mm. So tactically... She lost all of her super soldier serum, right? And most of her fellow super soldiers, certainly one is dead, but unless they all escaped after the fight, at least some of them probably got detained or apprehended. I'm not sure. But so she's tactically way, way, way down. Politically, her actions have caused, right, the exact opposite of her desired result. Because we heard those news reports and they were saying there's this new thing called the Patch Act that will make right. borders harder and presumably sharing more difficult. So she is losing the battle on the front to actually get the results she wants. She's losing the war, even as she loses her army. I mean, at the same time, that same news report said that support for her organization was growing. It's true. But I think that that is support. And the Patch Act is an actual law that is going to make shit harder right. and worse. And so at a minimum, she's creating as many enemies as she is creating you know, fans and supporters. And unfortunately, those enemies appear better equipped to enact their agenda. And she lost all of her collateral with the power broker, right? Oh, true. Yeah. You know, because like that serum, even if she kept one, she could have been able to barter with it or something like now. Now, what does the power broker have? He doesn't have a scientist that could analyze her blood or anything like that. So I'm not even sure that Carly is worth being alive to the power broker right now. So who knows? The part that I was also thinking about is how much she lost herself too. She threatened Sarah and her kids and you could see how much yeah. after she hung up the phone that kind of ruined her. And Zemo might have been early in his assessment that she was a lost cause, which is what he said to Sam. But I do think by the end of the episode, even Carly might be thinking of herself as a lost cause based on her reaction to Nico's death and realizing what she had just done to Lamar and how fucked she is across the board. Yeah, I think her face when she realized what she had done to Lamar was quite a moment for her because, you know, I think she's fine when she's fighting somebody who's on her level and she has no qualms about killing folks like that like she said you know her whole plan is to kill captain america which in essence i think she did do right like she kind of killed the symbol that is captain america even if she didn't kill walker but when she killed lamar instead you could tell that that was not something that she wanted to do she didn't realize that she was battling a mortal at that point or even what her power could do i think she meant to right. throw him off of her and instead, she broke his neck. And I think that was maybe the first time that the super soldier serum's full impact on her and what it turned her into dawned on her. Yeah. Who might have lost more than even they or we, the audience, realized this week? Well, my response kind of picks up on, on the list of things that you kind of quickly went through before you got into your answer for the last question. And for me, it's Steve and his legacy. Ouch. Yeah. So, and it honestly doesn't take much to taint a legacy. And, and, and while the show has been exploring Steve's faults and mistakes, those flaws aren't really being consumed by the public in the MCU, right? It's for the viewers of the show. So in their world, Steve is still this heroic, iconic, and when you listen to StoryCast, messianic figure. <laughs> and that shield is so wrapped up in Steve Rogers and folks' view of him. You know, that's been a constant through line throughout the show. And the final image we get, Jesus, is, is this new Captain America, indignant with blood and probably bone all over that shield. 
So now when folks say Captain America, that's the image they have in their heads. Not Wholesome Steve. Not the shield as a means of defense, but as an offensive weapon. And we know from the trailers that Sam eventually gets the shield. So I kind of wonder if Sam's stock is about to go down a little bit, too, because of his association with the shield. Who would want to carry it now? Yeah, that's a great point. Is there a way to do Captain America without that shield? I think Sam can fulfill the role of Captain America. But after that moment in Riga in the square... Why would you want to be the next Captain America? Why would you want to have that title? Because it's so incredibly tainted right now. I mean, you could be like, hey, that was John Walker. John Walker lost his shit. You know, America disavows John Walker, et cetera, et cetera. But he was still in that dumbass Captain America uniform wearing that shield and that's going to be that's going to be the headline the above the fold image that everyone across the world is going to see like why would you want to be associated with that and maybe part of what they're going to do here is have sam realize he doesn't need to be somebody else's moniker he doesn't need to wear captain america as a name because he's already who he is falcon not black falcon but falcon exactly and being falcon i think is pretty fucking awesome I've got one out of left field for you, Christine. I love it. I think Yori Nakajima lost a shitload more than we realized this week. And here's why. Because Zemo knows his name and he knows he's a weak spot for Bucky after he brought it up to Bucky and Bucky flipped the fuck out on the plane. Zemo is gone and he specifically was asked by Sam in this episode, what about Bucky? And gave no real response. I think he's on his way to Yori's house, and I think he's going to use him as leverage for some kind of terrible choice or outcome for Bucky. That's where Zemo's headed. I am terrified for Mr. Nakajima. I think he lost a whole shitload more than people realized this week. And now I'm terrified. I really hope there are a lot of Nakajimas throughout America because Yori is precious and must be protected at all costs. So, Mark, way to terrify me. What the fuck, man? Well, the other thing that sucks is this is how Yori's going to learn that Bucky is the one who killed his kid because Zemo's going to tell him it's his whole thing. You need to, you can never trust super soldiers. They're terrible people. One of them killed your son. And by the way, it's the guy you've been going to lunch with. Yori's going to take that real hard. I also think, though, if and when they get on the other side of this whole situation, Yori will see the bigger picture. He will forgive some or all of everything that happened with Bucky because Bucky was a tool of, you know, these other people. and He was under my control. So I'm hoping that it doesn't work out the way that Zemo expects. But that doesn't mean that Yori is not in tremendous danger in the next episode. Yeah. Oh, God. Poor Yori. Separate from these broader judgments, which, you know, I love to force you into these difficult positions where you have to choose winners and losers. I want us to interrogate some of the smaller details of the show itself, the way people think in this show. I want to start with plans, big ideas, somebody who tried to enact an agenda of some kind. Was there anyone that you thought had a big idea or a plan that was really cool, interesting or successful in this episode? Okay, I don't know about cool or interesting, but I think this plan was pretty successful. And that was Carly deciding to separate Sam, Bucky, Hoskins, and Walker, and then kill Captain America. And it didn't go exactly to plan. It didn't. Um, First of all, Sam didn't come by himself, but maybe she figured that Sam would come with Bucky, that if you're talking to Sam, it means you're talking to Bucky, too. Just like if I'm talking to you, Mark, I totally expect you to have the same conversation with Amanda. (laughs) And like, you know, partners are just like one person. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe Carly expected that, but figured they wouldn't bring in Hoskins and Walker. Right. And she didn't know Walker was juiced, so her plan was really strong. Right, exactly. So I think they probably would have been able to effectively carry it out per the original plan, but they still end up killing Captain America because his reputation is dead. That's a great point. Absolutely dead. So I think. Carly is exactly where she wants to be at the end of the episode. Unfortunately, she has another 
super soldier enemy, which is unfortunate. And she lost one of her own. But her plan basically went the way it was supposed to, for the most part. Yeah, it's actually a good counter argument in general to how much she lost, because maybe Captain America doing this horrible thing will have the opposite effect uh, that they had hoped this Captain America's existence would have, right? That now people will turn even more against the Global Repatriation Council, that they will turn more towards the Flag Smashers because the terrorist is Captain America. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great point. I like that you talked about a plan that was a good idea that maybe didn't fully get to fruition, or at least not the way that the person intended. That's also kind of the plan that jumped out to me. And I was thinking a lot about Sam's approach to de-escalation. He -hmm. went after a nonviolent, high communication strategy to try to scale back and de-escalate all these really threatening situations, and in a way showing us what compassionate law enforcement might look like. His efforts are foiled by Walker at like every single turn. But as Sam has repeatedly indicated, it is the how that matters as much as the what. So he's coming into his own, he's trusting his instincts, and he's leading a new way. A new way that maybe America could be proud of, though it might be too late to rescue the Captain America moniker. But I think Sam had a plan. It was showing progress with Carly. Even if Carly, it didn't work out this particular one, he's on the right track. And I want to see him keep doing more of this. Oh, I'm in the same boat. I mean, I love... The fact that Sam is showing to us what a diplomacy first strategy looks like. And that used to be something that America was known for, was our diplomatic skills. And now it's just might first. Yeah. And that's extremely problematic, especially since we love to do it in black and brown countries. Um, and exercising that might, and it's just, it's not good folks. So the fact that we've got someone who is showing us what can happen if we choose our words very carefully and lead with them first, as opposed to busting through a fucking door, right? screaming your title, screaming your authority and making demands. That's just not the way to do things that sometimes it's so much better to have a conversation with someone. I mean, Carly could kill Sam. She could have. Sam wasn't wearing any of his armor. He went in there in plain clothes, calm demeanor, just wanting to talk. And they were able to have that conversation. Walker could do the same, but he doesn't have those skills at all. But one thing I do appreciate about Sam is that he understands when it's time to talk and when it's time to act. So I think the clothing choices were very important. So he walks into Mamadonia's funeral in his plain clothes. But at the end, after Carly threatens his sister and his nephews, he's wearing the full Falcon uniform and like still wants to talk. He didn't come in flying he walked in like yo that's how you gonna do me like that's where we are right now sis like what's going on Mm -hmm. um but he was prepared to throw down if he needed to sam and walker on opposite ends of the policing spectrum right sam Mm -hmm. is leading with a a community first perspective if you will like a like he's trying to reach people and find commonalities that was his whole approach talking about with his relationship with sarah to her which you mentioned as a you know, something that, you know, actually wound up kind of maybe potentially working out for Sarah, this whole conversation. Not only does Sam try to help Carly, Carly winds up helping Sam as a result of the conversation, you know? So that approach is just much, much stronger. Yes, it creates risk for the person coming in. Like you said, Carly could technically kill him. But the whole point is if you approach things openly, honestly, and non-threateningly, you can get a lot farther in a lot of situations. And I think the state has an obligation to default to nonviolence for as much and as long as possible, even if the people who take on that role are the ones who then absorb that risk. So, yeah, if I could just make one more point, um, and I kind of want to go back to the idea of the clothing choices being indicators of what's going to happen. Definitely. Um, one thing that we haven't noticed about Walker's uniform until this episode is the fact that his his um, American flag that he wears on his arm isn't in color. 
it's muted. It's kind of grayscale. It's it's not exactly that. black and white. Yeah, but there's at at the end when he's when he's roiding out right um, in the middle of the square. There's a close up that his um, the top of his bicep is in there. Or the top of his tricep, sorry, is in there, and you can see the flag very clearly, and it's kind of grayscale. And that flag goes back to the Civil War, and it's a symbol of no quarter being given. It was oh, wow. used by Confederates. Um, so it kind of means don't take prisoners, but also indicates, like, I don't want to be a prisoner. Kill me right away. But the no quarter given tends to mean more, you know, um, I will show no mercy. I will immediately exercise what I think is justice and end your life. So the fact that Walker wears that symbol on his uniform kind of told us early on that he wasn't going to give quarter to anyone. He wasn't going to try to deescalate things. He was going to provide his justice as he saw fit right then and there whenever he had a prisoner. That's scary as hell because people talk a lot about the uniform. I mean, we were joking about it on StoryCast, for example, and everyone makes fun of his ears. I certainly have. And the whole helmet thing. I saw something on Reddit about how if you look at his helmet, it kind of looks like a skull, like a red skull kind of a vibe. Yes. The mm -hmm. eyes and the way the nose folds over looks like the red skull's nose, whatever. All that stuff is sort of light stylistic stuff. But you're actually talking about something significant, both in terms of story and also narrative and American justice and the sort of in continuing injustice of it, like the way that Walker is perpetuating not just decades, but centuries of American oppression. Yeah. And the only reason why I even know this is because of the Blue Lives Matter moment, because they have taken that flag and added a blue line to it. No so if shit. you see, yes, child, yes. So I'm telling you, when you were talking about how Walker is kind of like the symbol for modern um, policing, he's basically a Blue Lives Matter dude, because all that's missing from that flag on his arm is the blue line. Damn, I got goosebumps from like how fucked up that is. Like right now, my, the hair on my arms is standing up. That is terrifying. Yeah. Well, Walker, hopefully you're fucked. But I think one of the things Jesse wants to get into in PonderVision is whether Walker would actually be fucked in our world. So stay tuned for more on John Walker and his policing style uh, in PonderVision. Was there... Any specific decision that somebody made? So we talked about plans. That's great. But any just a choice or an idea that somebody had, big or small, that you thought was excellent or interesting? I mean, I guess I'll be a basic bitch and just say thank you, Zemo, for destroying the serum. Because oh. <laughs> I feel like that was a pretty pivotal choice. And he paused before he started <laughs> destroying them. So like you have this moment where you're like, Jesus Christ, is he about to take the serum? Like what, what is going on? Um, but as everyone says, Zemo has a code and he's dedicated to it. And he has the commitment to follow through on his mission to the very end. And Obviously, this serum is fucking problematic, dude. Like, we don't need any more of it. Um, the folks who have taken it of late have been troublesome. You've got a band of revolutionaries who are bombing people. You have Walker decapitating people. The serum is fucking problematic. So I'm glad it's gone. In many ways, this show is making the argument against Marvel superheroes. And I'm mm. curious how they end it and what we take away from it. Because if the serum is bad, then everybody's potentially bad. Captain Marvel is just as potentially bad as a super soldier made by this serum in that, you know, she has all this ability and power and strength that nobody else has. And it's only by the grace of her judgment that she operates that with kindness or whatever you know, Monica is a superhero now. That's awesome. We're all super excited. But the argument against the serum is also an argument against Monica. And I, I wonder how they land that in a way that says we should watch all these other shows. 
Right. I feel like they've been they've been kind of laying the groundwork for that for a while now. I can't remember which which movie it is when Vision was saying that our strength invites conflict. Yes. I can't remember if it was Infinity War or Civil War, maybe when they were talking about the Sokovia Accords. That may, that sounds more accurate, yeah. right? I, this might have been a Sokovia Accords debate point. But right. the fact that their their strength, their increased strength exists, invites conflict. Like people want to challenge it. Therefore, there will always be kind of like this arms race of technology as to what can make you a bigger and badder Soldier. I mean, so much of Marvel has been about trying to reproduce the goddamn super soldier serum, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really really interesting to see how this narrative plays out once the show wraps. If that attitude is going to continue to be a source of conflict for even the good guys to have to deal with internally yeah because the cat is out of the bag there are bad people with a bunch of powers now and we get into the central question that people pose in politics and military challenges all the time which is when is force justified when is violence appropriate so we can't stop people making tanks now or nuclear weapons now and we get into the same kinds of arms race questions in the real world i wonder if this will basically treat superheroes the same way which is that We maybe kind of have to have our own superheroes now, us meaning the good people or people who want justice or whatever, because the only alternative is people who have powers and are terrible just running wild over the world. That doesn't necessarily, there are a lot of reasons why people propose pacifism and nonviolence at all costs. There's a lot of philosophy around that. And maybe the Marvel Universe is going to interrogate some of that. The other thing that it might be setting up is the real anti-hero beliefs that would undergird something like the development of mutants. Mm -hmm. And even separate from that with mutants or even just Spider-Man and potentially Miles Morales, if they ever bring him into the MCU, getting powers that you didn't intend to get accidents, right? right? Bruce Banner is an accident. Mm -hmm. And maybe there'll be a lot more of that, whether it's She-Hulk or Ms. Marvel maybe gets her powers accidentally. So it's a lot to unpack here. It's just so much more philosophical and challenging than I think people even instinctively to this day, think about the MCU. There's just a shitload going on. Too much, but I'll take all of it. Not enough, I (laughs) I don't want it all. So the one decision I wanted to flag was a small one. It was the displaced teacher talking to Sam. I think this entire episode could have gone differently, and maybe Sam's whole plan for nonviolence doesn't even develop if the plight of the displaced isn't put right in front of him, if he doesn't have to confront it the hard way. The teacher is firm with Sam, but also open hearted with what's going on with his displaced folks. I think if he had not engaged Sam, Sam might have been more frustrated than understanding. But this centered Sam into the place where he could then take that plan I was talking about forward. So I thought that teacher did a solid. I mean, and it was it was a critical, critical, critical moment. I am so glad you highlighted it, because without that conversation, Sam wouldn't have necessarily known that he first needs to lay down a groundwork of trust that him and his kind are just inherently distrusted by this group of people, the do-gooders or the official do-gooders, right? The supposed do-gooders like the GRC, you know, she doesn't necessarily know that he's not affiliated with that organization, but You know, the Avengers kind of play the same role. They're supposed to be this global force for good. But when they come in, there's all of this collateral damage that happens. And, you know, people have to really question, are they actually providing a type of good when there's so much destruction also associated with them showing up into your town? So Sam really needed to have that conversation with the teacher to understand he needs to go in, first of all, not hot and just have that conversation with Carly and do the de-escalation because she's not going to trust a single word he says if he doesn't come at her at the right way. Well said. So what about the single worst idea or choice in this episode? What was it? Oh, I, I hate saying this because he's gone now 
But Hoskins telling Walker he would take the serum. (laughs) Oh, boy, did that have consequences for me. It's the one time Hoskins failed to reel John in from being too extreme. That's been a role we've seen Hoskins play almost from the moment we meet him, right? Like he's there to both prop John up, but also be the saucer to John's hot ass tea, right? Like he's <laughs> he's there to cool him down and bring him bring him to reality and help him think clearly and all of that. Um, but that was the one moment where he didn't realize that John was basically asking him about his next course of action. You know, Walker was not clear about really what that question was about. So I can't really put blame on Lamar. But in that moment, oh, if Hoskins had just said, nah, man, like power makes you more of who you are. And if Lamar had just a little bit more, (laughs) a, a better idea of who Walker really was and how that serum would amplify him, maybe he would have had a different answer. But, you know, I think it was an honest answer from Hoskins. It still tracks with his personality and his relationship with Walker and his history, you know, and he's thinking about Afghanistan and all the lives that they could have saved if the two of them were super soldiers But at the same time, like, that's his motivation. Walker just wants to make his job easier. Right. That's all Walker's after. So, yeah, that moment, that moment was pretty pivotal for me. It's a big one. And, of course, Lamar doesn't have complete information, like you're saying. He doesn't know Walker has the damn vial in his pocket, I don't think. And it's just a question of commiserating over what for Lamar is a purely theoretical question. I also can't ding him too hard because I have the same answer to the question, which is, of course, I would take the serum. Like, I'm just not, it's not even a question for me as to whether I would take the serum if only just for, you know, the ability to, like, have, be way sturdier and live a longer life and all that. I mean, that all sounds pretty good to me. So I have a tough time saying that I would turn it down. So I can't be too mad at Lamar about that. Though I wasn't also talking to John Walker. I'm talking to Christine Kippins. I feel like there's slightly different relationship. I am there. definitely looking at you and Dr. A differently this Why? week. Because Me and Amanda taken? are over in not taking the serum corner. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Living yeah. our happy lives, being content in exactly who we are because like, first of all, I'm already I feel like I'm already a lot. So for a lot to then be amplified would just be like, what the fuck would that be? That would just be way too much. Or exactly what the world needs. I don't know. No, I don't think, think the away. world needs me on a fucking super serum at all. <laughs> but now I've got you and Dr. A in the super villain category. I That's take where it. I'm going to I'm going to put it. you two. I, I look, I can make an extended argument about it. Maybe I'll think about how to do that for Ponder Vision. Yeah, because it's it's interesting to me that it's even an open question for anybody else. It's that level of automatic choice for me. So so there's a lot to unpack about the serum. I want to continue to think about it. Without question, the show makes the case for not ever doing that. And I don't know, I want to think more about it, I guess. But it's it's challenging me, someone who never would have even hesitated in the past to, to answer that question, to at least think about it. So hey, well done. Yeah, well, I don't want Nagel's one. If 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 there was a choice, I would take Erskine's one because I'm really short. And I've got back issues. So like, I want to become the big hulking machine. I don't want to, I don't want to stay exactly the same. I, I could, I could grow a couple of inches and stuff and have some nice cut biceps. That'd be really sweet. Yeah, I agree with that too. And it's always the case that we haven't seen Nagel's serum for super long. There could be some horrible right. side effects. So I'm going to be clear. I'm not talking about the off brand shit. I would, I would definitely take the name brand shit anyway. Yeah. I had also a worst choice or idea, and it was Bucky crossing the Dora Milaje. And here's why. Because he lost allies. He lost refuge in that moment. He also lost the title of White Wolf because she calls him James at the end. And that's what Zemo calls him. And I think the show is making it clear that Bucky is no longer a friend of the Dora Milaje. And that is a mistake because hunting Carly might not be worth that trade off. I mean, I'm surprised you're not saying that he also lost the love of his life. 
because yeah, <laughs> I think might. you're a Bucky Io ship shipper, right? <laughs> well, and we clearly saw they had some very intimate time alone when Bucky was at his most exposed and vulnerable. I, you know, that's I'm just saying maybe something maybe something happened. I I definitely want to talk about the Dora Milaje uh, later on. I am very curious about the choice that they made to have Io's final words to Bucky be a mystery because, you know, typically when folks speak in Wakandan, there are subtitles and the subtitles this time around said, speaking in Wakandan, comma, James. And I was just like, well, shit, what the hell did she say to him? Um, But you're right. Maybe all we need to focus on is the fact that she called him James and not White Wolf, because now feelings have been hurt and he literally got in the middle of the Dormelage and their fight, which is not something you ever, ever, ever want to do. But he was saying, let's just talk about this. Which I don't, I don't necessarily blame him for, but he did get that vibranium arm involved as he was saying, let's just talk about this. And also it was a more a question of like, he fucked them over by not just immediately handing over Zemo, I think, because there was, they didn't get far enough. There was no way eight hours was ever going to be enough in the first place, but yeah. really it doesn't even matter the, he calls Zemo a means to an end, which as we've talked about all last episode, especially was interrogating, but there are often consequences for a bad means. And in this case, he tr- he thought he could do something with Zemo yeah. and he was fucking wrong about it. And they were telling him, I was telling him to his face that that was a mistake. And if there's a runner up to this choice uh, for Bucky, it's that he did not even try to get the Dora Milaje to help him with his mission in return for handing over Zemo. His tunnel vision for using Zemo might have cost everything because I have a feeling the Dora Milaje could have helped resolve the situation much more effectively than Zemo while Zemo was also handed over to the people who rightfully mm-hmm. deserve to punish him in the way that they see fit for killing their king. Mm-hmm. So Good damn it, point, Bucky. Mark. F minus. I want to talk about some of the roles of characters in the story a little bit. We've gotten into the decision making. I want to pull back a little on our camera lens. What did you make of Lamar's death from a bit of a meta perspective? I guess what I'm asking is, was he reduced to being fridged? which is a term that just means basically killed for the sake of another character to have an arc upon. And in this case, that would be John Walker. Was he fridged for John Walker to have an arc upon? And the reason I bring this up is because fridging is a term that is usually reserved for women, for characters of color, for LGBTQ characters, so that usually straight white dudes have some kind of growth as a character or change as a character. I'm still processing on this and I'm just curious what you think. I don't have a clear answer. I mean, my answer is unfortunately yes. And, you know, I'm really sorry to lose him. I mean, never mind the fact that I teased him by calling him Battlestar Galactica. I liked Lamar as a character. Like I've kind of said before, if Walker is Wanda, Lamar is Vision. Like the reason why John is seen as this amazing soldier is because Lamar is there to constantly walk him off of ledges. Yeah. He soothes Walker. He calms him down. He helps him see clearly. So now with him gone, Walker is free to create an alternative reality where he tortures an entire town for his depression and nightmares and forces them to play out sitcom fantasies, you know, or, or go around decapitating people with an iconic defense weapon. Um, And can I just say the fact that Walker decapitated Nico and fell from cap glory all at the same moment is an amazing play on words. Walker will be decapped by the U.S. Department of Defense in the next episode, I'm sure. Like that Captain America title has been taken away from him. He has been decapped. But anyway, back to Lamar. Um, Walker could have simply roided out, decapitated Nico in front of Lamar. And Lamar could have abandoned him because of that, because he was already looking at John funny this episode. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That could have been a natural progression from what had been happening from this episode. They didn't need to kill Lamar. They just needed to get him off of Captain America's team. Oh, excuse me. They needed to get him (laughs) off of Walker's team 
please don't put that in mark please edit that <laughs> i don't know i might I mean, we'll see i think i think you know it, it, I, like i said i'm still processing this it felt off for me from a writing and narrative perspective for some reason and that's kind of why i wanted to dig into it a little bit if there's something that redeems it for me it's that lamar's death means more than something for john walker it means something right. for carly too and i think at that level it starts to approach a more legitimate narrative choice as opposed to this convenient device to kill a character of color so that John Walker can break bad or whatever. If Carly has some kind of growth and change as a development too, it starts to become a more central component to the story that means something. So I don't know, does that change the equation at all? I don't know. I mean, if we just look at this episode alone, we don't think about what's going to happen next. We just look at this episode. Lamar dies. We see Carly's face react and she's horrified. Everyone scatters. Bucky and Sam go after the Flag Smashers and trying to chase after them. And John loses his shit and then jumps out the window. I'm really annoyed they gave him a superhero landing. And then chases down Nico and decapitates him in front of everybody. So and then the episode ends. So all that we see in terms of action, in terms of like a reaction that has legs is John's. All we see is what that death did to Walker. So we see that Carly is horrified by what she did, but we don't necessarily know if she's going to take that lesson and apply it to something, right? Like we haven't, True. we'll see what happens in episode five, but we don't know for sure that it did anything other than make her feel bad for a moment. Yeah. But what we did see was John move from Captain America to probably the most hated man on the planet. Yes. The show's not done, so I'll reserve final judgment, I guess, based on what you're saying, because we don't know, and that is a good point. And I don't want to read too much into Carly's reaction, because if they underplay it, then that doesn't count as any sort of complicating factor. Well, let's keep mm -hmm. talking and thinking about how Lamar's death affects the episode ahead. Now let's switch to talking about the Dora Milaje. From, again, because I'm kind <laughs> they're awesome, and I want to keep talking about it. From Bucky to Walker to Zemo, I think they play a huge role in a variety of characters' stories. What did you think was the most important role they played in this episode? For me, it's a little meta. And it's reminding folks how so much of what white people have today is from what was taken from or made by black people. Hmm. The empires of Europe pillaged Africa for its resources, left it underdeveloped, created borders without consideration for the tribes they were pushing together or separating from one another or without regard for access to natural resources. And let's not forget, stole its people, right? Yeah. <laughs> All for white profit. America was built by the labor of enslaved black people. And white people walk this earth today, every day, not thinking about that fact. Mm-hmm. White privilege tells them that everything they've earned in life is because of their hard work, not because of the centuries of oppression that nearly eradicated Native Americans and the labor and subjugation of people of color as second class citizens, if even citizens at all. Bucky doesn't think of that arm as a piece of Wakandan technology that was given to him so that he could be helpful in an upcoming fight for global survival. And Walker doesn't think of that shield as coming from Wakanda either. Bucky thinks of that arm as his arm, yes. as part of him. And Walker thinks of that shield as his weapon that he has done the work for and has earned to carry. And when the Dora took them both away for just a moment, just a moment, they each had terrible fear in their eyes and Bucky even had the nerve to look betrayed the door Malache are here to remind y'all of your white privilege and the fact that what makes America strong was stolen from black indigenous and people of color yeah that's an incredible answer that might be the best answer to any question in any marvelous tv club episode it is in many ways 
a thing that comes down to that moment when she just quickly removes Bucky's arm. And like you said, and his powerlessness and helplessness and the fact that he had just been so blind that he brushes off Io at the beginning when she's like, hey, we spent a lot of time and money to fix your ass. And he's like, hey, I'm grateful. Well, where the fuck does that gratitude get them? Because Zemo walks away in the end and they were 100% right as the moral compass in this episode, right? They were very clear about where these lines should be drawn. And in the end, they need to humiliate Bucky to put him in his place. And hopefully it sticks. Yeah. Well, look, we talked about Zemo. We've got some good stuff. And you said something that makes me want to circle back to Zemo before we get out of this roles debate. Mm -hmm. We had a big discussion on StoryCast about whether Zemo is a kind of Prometheus character in which he delivers an equal playing field between gods and mortals by destroying the super soldier serum. Or is he kind of an anti-Prometheus figure because he's denying mortals access to the power of the gods? You reflected on the fact that he hesitated when he stepped on those serum Mm -hmm. vials and... I think that's really interesting because it does convey that he is pure of his mission. But which mission is it, Christine? Is he leveling the playing field or is he denying us the chance to level the playing field? Where do you land? So before I specifically get to my answer, I just want to flag a couple of things to set the stage. First, I love this idea as Zemo, as Prometheus. It's a really interesting identification. So like kudos to StoryCast. Second, Whenever I think about and talk about Prometheus, um, I never characterize like the fire as power of the gods. I always describe it as technology. Okay. So fire was like the first advance in technology with Greek mythology for humanity. Um, So Prometheus for me gifted mankind science and technology when he gave them the ability to make fire. So that's just how I frame things moving forward, right? So I support the idea that Zemo is more like an anti-Prometheus character than a straight Prometheus because he was focused on eliminating man's access to God-level technology. You know, like he killed the Winter Soldiers, he killed Nagel, he tried to kill Carly, and he destroyed all of the serum. He is doing his best to ensure that men remain men and not have the technology to ascend to being gods. Additionally, Sam called him out for talking like a god. So at least that puts him on Prometheus's level, (laughs) right? But rather than giving technology, he's eradicating it from the earth. So it's definitely on the anti side. But for me... Where Zemo and Prometheus differ, however, is in their respect for mankind. Hmm. What made Prometheus unique among the Titans and the Olympians was that he respected mankind, maybe even loved us. For the rest of the gods, men were entertainment. They were into reality TV long before we were. (laughs) Man was created for their entertainment, to be toyed with, to be tortured, to be used to make other gods jealous. And above all, man was made to worship the gods. So there was no respect there. Prometheus was the only one who recognized humanity as something valuable and worthy of respect. He had an optimistic view of mankind. Zemo doesn't have any of that. He's very cynical. He assumes the worst about Carly. He doesn't believe we'll have another Captain America like Steve Rogers, even though he's saying that to a man who is very similar to Steve Rogers at his core in Sam. And Zemo is willing to kill people. He's willing to mind control people. And he's willing to frame others for his murder. These aren't the actions of a person who loves and respects the concept of humanity. Right. So that's kind of where I fall on the um, Zemo Prometheus debate. Well, that's a really interesting insight. You know, it's no secret to the listeners where I land. As I was saying on StoryCast, I think the fact that he's only tearing down one system of inequality makes the whole level the playing field argument a little dodgy for me. Mm -hmm. Because he's very happy to leave money and all the other things that separate him from those masses that maybe he doesn't respect enough in place. And so unless he had a broader agenda like that, I have a tough time believing that his heart is truly in the right place as opposed to framing what is best for him as best 
for everyone, but you've given me a lot of new things to think about, especially reframing the fire as technology. That's really, really cool. Yeah, that's why that's why I think it's it's important to kind of say that at the beginning, because if we're talking about leveling the playing field, period, then 100 percent like there's no way that you could equate him to Prometheus because he's not exactly redistributing wealth or any of that. In fact, the way he talks, as Sam calls him out, he talks like a god. He's the one who determines who has power and who doesn't. I think, as you said in StoryCast, he doesn't care until his place of privilege and power is threatened because of the existence of these super soldiers, right? That's what he's going after. It's only super soldiers. He's not going after someone like Sam who has, who who doesn't have innate abilities, but is still able to fight at a certain level, right? Like he's still very cordial with Sam and doesn't treat him the same way he treats Bucky, right? So I think when you frame it as technology that helps you ascend to the level of gods, it's a little bit of a different frame because that's what he's about. It's not about having equal levels of power. It's having godlike power. It's having the technology to ascend to that kind of level that Zemo is like, "Mm -mm, we're not doing this. We'll see if if super soldier serum is just technology, then I don't see why it's so bad if I were going to take it, Christine. What's the problem? I don't get it. I'm just, it's like buying a new iPad, right? What's the difference? Oh my God. No, it's not like buying a new iPad. Okay. 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 But, well, but the thing is, I would be very curious to see you on super soldier serum. Like, can you imagine how quickly you would edit this podcast? Well, it doesn't give you super speed, right? I actually wonder how much that would help. Maybe, in, if anything, I'd accidentally type and break all the keys on my keyboard without realizing it and shit. Look how fast Bucky chased down that truck well, and, yeah. in, this, in the second episode. But you can't, it doesn't mean you can like zoom around on a computer screen. I don't know. It's interesting how much, I guess you're right. Maybe I would like get an increase in motor skills. I'd like to promise that I would only use my powers for good, but apparently nobody can really know until the super soldier serum's in their veins. So, mm. Well, you know, let's keep thinking about whether or not this is the right choice. But in the meantime, do you have any questions for me before we close out? I do. And I would like to go back to Zemo for a second. So he has smashed all the serum. He helped the boys connect with Carly. And that connection now has yielded a phone number by which... Sam can communicate directly with Carly. John Walker is now about to become decapped. Has Zemo served his purpose for the story? Is it like perfect timing that he has now escaped? Or do you think he has more to contribute to the story? I mean, obviously, you've got this Yori theory. I sure but, do. you know, kind of beyond that. Or maybe that's that is the simple answer. He's got to go find Yori now. But beyond that, do you think Zemo has kind of served his purpose for the story? I hope they're just getting started with him in the MCU overall, because the cat is out of the bag, like we were talking about on Super Soldiers. And there's always going to be room for a villain with a point on this. And I hope that Bucky stands in in this series for the question of all the heroes that we like, because... We're going to feel bad about Zemo going after Bucky in a way that we wouldn't feel bad about him going after Carly or those vials of super serum. Mm -hmm. And that gets at the heart of the problem with these heroes. We like the heroes we like, but we don't like the heroes we don't. The problem is it's the power itself. So Zemo's always going to have a point and always remain relevant. In my dream scenario, he becomes like part of something with like Doctor Doom and the Fantastic Four movies and all that because they're going to build some fortress of strength in Eastern Europe or whatever, and it would be really cool. So I think he, in this story, isn't done because super soldiers aren't done. And I still think we haven't really interrogated the question of our own friendly super soldier Bucky enough. So yeah, the Yori thing's going to play into all of that. I just hope we're not done with Zemo in the MCU overall. Yeah, I agree. I kind of wish I could go back to our 
our discussion of villains at the end of WandaVision Mm -hmm. and kind of sneak Zemo into my top five because he really is an absolutely fascinating villain. The fact that he's played such a helpful role here, I think is interesting. Sometimes I wonder though about the, about whether or not this show is rehabilitating his reputation with viewers. Um, I think, you know, as far as I know with the comics, Zemo's a goddamn Nazi. Right? Yeah, terrible <laughs> like, person. Although he does join the Thunderbolts, which is like a General Ross thing. I think they complicate him a little bit more in the 21st century than he ever was in the 20th. But yeah, he was just a straight up Nazi before that. Yeah. So I kind of I kind of wonder about the uh, the judging him up a little bit and 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 what that says, because. You know, he has been helpful. He's the only one that has been able to kind of move the story along in terms of tracking down the flag smashers and getting intelligence and all of that. But yeah, I I do wonder, though, about his rehabilitation among the fandom. I mean, that one dance scene has done an awful lot. (laughs) It It sure has. But look, if there's one commonality between Agatha, Carly and Zemo, in Marvel TV, it's that they are all your favorite kind of villain, the villain with a point. Yeah. And I hope that this just means it's going to be less about the Darren Crosses of the world, which we've talked about before, you know, the bad guy from Ant-Man or any of these people who are just patently evil. We need some of them, don't get me wrong. But when they bring in Kang the Conqueror and Ant-Man 3 or whatever, will we get a cool, interesting perspective like this? Because if all the super soldier serum arguments have weight, it means there's... No such thing as just an angelic good guy, which means there should really be no such thing as a super uniquely terrible old school Baron Zemo type bad guy, the one from the comics. I just think we're kind of past that storytelling if you want the MCU to have relevance now. When we discussed WandaVision, we always talked about the big bad, right? And Mm -hmm. we tried to figure out whether it was Hayward or whether it was (laughs) Agnes slash Agatha Um, and it was relatively easy for us to figure out who it was, although there was always this lingering thought of Mephesto, right? Who could still very well be the power broker, who knows? Um, but, (laughs) but in this show, do you think Carly and Zemo are the big bads? Is it the power broker or is Carly an anti-hero? Because I tell you, when she and Sam were talking at Mom and Donia's funeral, it felt like a conversation between T'Challa and Killmonger. Right. That was the vibe that I got. No, I think anti-hero is a is 100% a better word for Carly. I just mean she's an antagonist. Antagonist is a better word than um, bad guy or villain in the story. I think we're just moving past villainy outright for a lot of these stories. Not all of them. Again, you know, it's definitely going to still be a, a tool in the toolbox, but... We need stories that ask big, interesting questions need two sides to a debate, not one. Mm -hmm. So I just like more of that, more of that. And you're right about Hayward. As bad as we thought Hayward was, you could still see something from his perspective as a government official who is trying to wrangle all these unwranglable, ungovernable powers that are floating around. The, The loose nukes, as Thunderbolt Ross would have said. Yeah. I don't know. Well, those are all the questions that I have for you, Mark. This was a great discussion. Well, you're telling me. I just I can't wait to chew over all of this and more. The last question, Christine, is, of course, where can people find and follow you? Folks can find and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kippens K. And you can listen to me have more ridiculous commentary with my friend Jocelyn on the I'm a Need More Wine podcast, where Mark is about <gasps> to be a guest. I can't wait. It's my first official podcast guest appearance anywhere. So this will be fun for me. Can't wait to pop your podcast cherry, Mark. Woohoo. On that note, podcast powerhouses, that is our show for today. So check out our StoryCast. Keep an eye out for Pondervision on Wednesday. And even more importantly, if you're enjoying this show, please tell a friend and leave us a five-star Apple review if that's your platform of choice. Give us your thoughts or questions. Leaving those reviews, telling your friends makes a huge difference for us. All right. Until next time, let's go watch the Dormelage beat down John Walker on an infinite loop, shall we? I'll bring the popcorn.